All right. So this is Eliezer Yukowski, um, who is, as his own <laughs> uh, tagline says, the original AI alignment person. He's been on the TED stage and he uh, basically says there is no way that you can avoid super powerful AI killing everyone. Um, <clears throat> and as time has gone by, I've become more skeptical of this message. Um, but what I want to point out is the little stop icon beside his name. Now, there are uh, there is a movement of people that will have either the, the stop symbol or the pause logo uh, emoji beside their name. And this is this is all emblematic of the pause movement. And we'll talk uh, a little bit more in just a second, but I want to I want to spend a little bit more time talking about Eliezer specifically. Now, this is someone who is very highly respected. He's been on the TED stage, but by his own admission, he doesn't know that much about math or coding. Um, and so his decision framework his, t that, lead, that led him to the conclusion that AI will kill everyone is basically his own logic. Uh, so there is, there is a movement in modern contemporary philosophy which basically says you don't need any epistemic or ontological grounding. You only need pure logic. Um, and having read some of his work, like, yeah, like he's, he's, he's a, he's a good rationalist. He's good at using words to construct arguments, but without any grounding, it's basically just kind of trust me. I used my imagination, bro, um, energy. Uh, and so as, and remember, I'm someone who took the AI safety thing very, very seriously. Uh, I have even written a book about it, but as more time goes by, the less concerned I am about AI safety. Humans are the bad guys. It's not the machines that we build. When you look at what AI can do today, it's not particularly a threat. And even when you project out what it might be able to do and emphasis on the word might, um, you have to make a lot of assumptions to say that AI is going to kill everyone. Should we pause AI? The TLDR is no. The, what I'm referring to here is the pause giant AI experiments that came out from the Future of Life Institute on March 22nd, 2023. So that was, what, a year and a half ago? Um, this was that, that landmark letter by Max Tegmark and a few others uh, that basically said, we need a six-month pause. Now, of course, that six-month window has come and gone, which I kind of thought that people would like get over it. Um, you know, by then, because pausing is what, like, what, what would we achieve during a pause? Um, but people are still calling for it. And I'm like, why are people still calling for it? Now, I have a pretty strong suspicion as to why people are calling for it, which I'll talk about a little bit later in the video. Uh, but my point is, is that it's been a year and a half. People are still, you know, putting the pause icon, putting the stop icon um, as, as if this one solution is a magic bullet and it, it super isn't. Um, but it's an easy little tagline. So the primary arguments in favor of the pause is that this is going to be a way to implement safety and control mechanisms. But again, we could have implemented safety and control mechanisms in the interceding 18 months. And they also tend to act as if that, like there's been no progress on safety and control. Um, they also want us to stop and consider ethics, um, which, by the way, there's a couple of uh, machine ethics books that I'll put in the, uh, in the description um, one is uh, Weapons of Math Destruction, and the other is, I can't remember off the top of my head. Anyways, um, implement regulatory frameworks, societal impact, uh, address power dynamics. But, you know, it's like I don't really see, like, some of these, sure, like, yes, time will, will play out. But, again, you have to make a lot of assumptions about what AI will do, for instance, in order to assess uh, societal impact. Like, what kind of what I'm trying to say is that this is a natural experiment. And you can use all the forecasting and predictions and logical arguments and rational arguments, but until you have data, until you have actual data, you don't know what the impact is going to be. At a certain point, you just need to kind of find out. Um, and this is, this is one of the reasons why uh, particularly Western societies have taken a much more reactive approach to legislation. Uh, now, I will, I will concede that Europe um, is a little bit more proactive in terms of how they approach legislation and regulation. But at the same time, like we still need to have evidence-based and data-based um, arguments. And the fact that the pause movement is largely just rationalist argument-based actually really undermines it. Like you gotta, you gotta have some data, you gotta have some modeling in your, in your frameworks. Um, but you know, with the last year with Sam Altman going to Congress saying, Oh yeah, like, Hey, I could kill everyone. Like you, that, that was the level of credibility. But over time, over the last 18 months, 
this whole movement has not really been able to produce a whole lot in favor of saying, oh yeah, all the things that we prophesize, and it is a prophecy, so a prophecy is a faith-based prediction about what will happen in the future, none of it has really come to pass, and they haven't been able to provide any more evidence uh, to support this prophecy. So those are the primary arguments in favor. Uh, now the impact, though, this is really interesting because uh, when when this gigantic letter and everything else uh, came, and there was also what was it the twenty two word statement that like AI should be treated treated as an existential threat. It's like this is this is the shortest letter possible. Um, they have had their impact. Um, you know they they, ra- they raised awareness. You know Sam Altman and Gary Marcus went before Congress and said AI is going to kill everyone. Um, you know Eliezer Yukowski got on the TED stage and said AI is going to kill everyone. Um, and then like that's it. You know, we've got the public awareness, we got the support, we got the criticism. Um, we've even had, you know, an executive order, uh, the longest executive order in history on AI. We've also had several uh, landmark legislative and regulatory packages, the UK AI Act, the EU AI Act. Um, California, what is it, Senate Bill 1048 or 1049, something like that. So we've, 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 they, they won. They got, they got their point across and it's time to move on. Now, what I wanted to also add is that there are ongoing like efforts. So the active pause efforts, there's been protests, um, there's been legislation that I mentioned. Um, I was actually not even aware of the protests um, until I did a little bit of research for this video. Uh, but like, yeah, there were, there were protests shortly, uh, uh, sorry, a few months ago to demand stricter AI regulations. And of course, uh, with, the, uh, with the Hollywood writer strike over AI, um, no, it wasn't entirely AI, but that was a, that was one of the keystone uh, points being debated. Um, you know, there's been a few events. There was the deep fakes of Taylor Swift. There was the Hollywood uh, writer strike. So there's been a few other things where, where people are pushing back against AI, and that's fine. But that's what I mean. That is the organic process. Um, what what really concerns me about the pause movement is that it's a small but vocal minority that basically says, trust our logical reasoning, trust my imagination and give me control of this narrative. Um, If the data was there, the data was there and they would present it, but they don't have the data. All they have is logical arguments. And that's, that's, that's a beginning of a debate. But what we're, what really happens is uh, events, real, real life events with real life people and real life data needs to be collected. That's how science works. That's how legislation works. Uh, so yeah, that's that's my that's my ongoing criticism of the pause efforts. Now, speaking of arguments uh, for or against, I feel like I I am doing my best to give it a fair shake in favor of the pause argument. But let's talk about arguments against the pause argument. So number one, it's impossible to enforce, and even even the exponents of the pause argument said, "Oh yeah, this is wildly ineffective. Like it's not possible to enforce it," and they know that they did it out of a sense of hyperbole. Um, like I think I think it was even Max Tegmark who who wrote the thing. And don't get me wrong, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Max Tegmark. I read read his book Life 3.0 and agree with him on every count. But at the same time, a global pause movement is physically impossible. Uh, you know, we can't even get Iran to stop building its nuclear reactors. We can't get you know information in, into and out of North Korea. You know, like heck, we're going to be able to create a global pause movement. That's just not going to happen. And so when you keep arguing for something that is infeasible and ineffective, that is wasted time and energy. And then even if, you know, like we have control of ourselves, so we, we, we put on the brakes, there's, it's just a completely suboptimal strategy. Uh, it, when, you, when, when one nation pauses, guess what? Nobody else is going to pause. They're going to say, oh, you know, uh, they're going to they're gonna remember that Napoleon Bonaparte quotation, which is, um, never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake. Right. So, you know, nobody, nobody's going to say, oh yeah, no, we, we, we should pause. This is why no nation, uh, even the EU, even the UK, the U S no, no head of state or no state department for any nation has said, oh yeah, pause is a good idea. Why? Because it is a spectacularly bad idea from a geopolitical perspective. And here's another way of looking at it. So just from a, this is going to be appealing to the rationalist because don't get me wrong, a, a lot of my friends are in the rationalist community and I have a lot of respect for people in the rationalist community. So let's, let's use their own uh, method of argument against them. 
What is the opportunity cost of an AI pause? All of the resources, such as time, money, and social capital spent on advocating for a pause could be better allocated to addressing nuanced safety concerns. The Nash equilibrium suggests that all players should continue advancing rapidly as coordinating a pause is impractical. When you know that one strategy is dead in the water, you should pick a different strategy. And so it's led me to wonder, and this is actually why I'm making this video, is because there are plenty of very intelligent, very well-connected people still out there, some of which are my friends, some of which are, you know, that are people that I just see on online, um, that are wasting time and energy and cognitive cycles on the pause argument. Uh, we have better ways forward. We, ha we know what we can do in order to uh, advocate for safety. The pause movement had its, its, its 15 minutes, but it's time to really move on. And so from, from just a, a pure rationalist argument perspective, every moment of, of airwave, uh, every tweet about the pause movement, every video, every debate, every blog post, that mental energy could have been committed towards constructing a more nuanced, more progressive, and I don't mean progressive in the political sense, but I mean progressive in like something that has caught up with the times. Uh, constructing a better argument and and creating a better coordination mechanism um, rather than just the monotropic AI is going to kill everyone, so turn it all off. Nobody believes that. And the, the longer that people keep saying that, the longer that, that AI safety people say AI is just going to kill everyone, turn it off, like kind of the crazier they look, like the more fringe that they look. Um, and I'm kind of embarrassed for them because whenever I talk to industry insiders, they're like, yeah, that's not happening. Like they literally are like behind closed doors the pause people are being laughed at and like that kind of hurt. I like I, it hurts for, I hurt for them. <laughs> I re, I'm help, help me help you. I am trying to help here. So what are some of the alternatives that we're talking about? Uh, number one, I mean, it's, I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, particularly with, with my audience, emphasizing transparency, accountability, and public private partnerships. That means more transparency between corporations, government, universities, and other nonprofits and third parties. Um, we, can, we can get the benefits of AI um, and minimize the harms. We can invest more in uh, researching mechanistic interpretability, uh, which I don't even believe that that's necessary for AI safety, but a lot of people seem to believe that it is. And I don't think it would hurt to have mechanistic interpretability. But again, advocating for those individual nuanced things rather than the more hyperbolic, just, just shut it all down. Like that's just not going to work. Uh, so there's plenty of alternatives and I would rather spend more time researching alternatives such as what I call axiomatic alignment, um, which if you've watched my channel for any length of time, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll remember this term. So axiomatic alignment basically says, let's find what is axiomatically true between human interests and machine interest and align to that. Um, basically kind of where I'm at on this argument is that AI is going to force humanity to align itself. Um, and I'll actually be writing a pretty extensive Substack article about that. Um, it'll be called, I think it'll be called the fourth narrative. So anyways, hop over to my Substack and subscribe so you can see that when it comes out. Uh, but anyways, there's plenty of alternatives. Um, the, this doomer narrative of the sky is falling is, is getting old and it's not helpful. And even, even many of the, even uh, like some of the, some of the podcasts that I've been on already have a more nuanced conversation. Um, but yeah, so uh, just, just let's move on folks. Another thing is regulatory capture. So the revolving door between big tech and government raises questions about oversight and accountability. This has only gotten worse since OpenAI restructured their board of directors, um, now you might be wondering like, why am I bringing up regulatory capture in the pause argument? Who benefits, who benefits from, from this pause narrative? Uh, you know, put it, put it this way. Um, if open AI and Microsoft and Google and meta, um, are the only ones at the table saying, oh yeah, AI is going to kill everyone. You need to regulate it. And by the way, ask us how to regulate it. Um, I have been very suspicious of the doomer narrative of the AI is going to kill everyone, the sky is falling, um, shut it all down argument because it plays directly into the hands of corporate interests. And I know for a fact that many of my friends in the AI safety community, they are not necessarily in favor of, you know, corporate power anyways. Um, I'm not saying that they're all, you know, burn the corporations down. Arasaka is evil as well. Corporations need to be there. But, but my point is, is that the conversations that I have behind closed doors are far more nuanced 
and we need to take into account the entire picture. The, the entire picture includes talking about regulatory capture. It includes talking about geopolitical uh, contention around uh, these issues. Um, and that means looking at the possibility for another arms race, another Cold War, or even another hot war um, between uh, great powers. So you can't just say, AI might kill everyone in the, in the distant future, therefore throw everything into chaos today. Uh, that's kind of my that's kind of my my chief message here. Now, speaking of, um, this is something that I added to this slide deck last minute because as I've been paying more attention to the space, I realized that a lot of the Twitter accounts that have the pause icon after their names are only a few months old. And then I took a closer look and I said, "Oh yeah, I see what's going on here." Um, the there are troll bots out there, um, whether they're AI powered bots or human powered bots, doesn't matter. There are bot accounts, there are troll accounts that are in favor of the pause movement. And that was like, that's what really galvanized me to just make this video to say, look, if there are troll, troll farms out there that are in favor of the pause movement, that's really kind of all you need to know about it. Um, and what I, what, what, what I really hope that this video <laughs> does is shine a light on that because there are plenty of great people who sincerely believe that slowing research down, the decel movement, whatever you want to call it, would be a good thing. But consider why adversarial nations might be amplifying that narrative. Uh, that is cause that for me that is cause enough to uh, raise the alarm and pause and reflect on what is it that this movement is actually doing. Is it muddying the waters? Is it actually doing anything helpful? Um, at this point, I think that there's an astroturf movement um, to either reinforce or reinvigorate the pause movement. Um, but yeah, if you go, if you, if you notice those accounts out there on Twitter with the stop or the pause icon, check and see how old they are and see how small they are. And it's like, this is someone who's acting like they're an authority, but they've only been on Twitter for a few weeks or a couple months. Hmm. Seems kind of sus to me. So yeah, I just wanted to call all this to your attention. Um, my final thing is, is like, let's, let's move on. Um, the pause is an overly simplistic solution that fails to address the complex challenges of AI safety and may do more harm than good. The awareness has been achieved. It is an overly simplistic solution. It's potentially harmful. And I don't mean just to the AI safety movement itself. Um, I have been on Twitter saying that the AI safety movement does appear to be cannibalizing itself um, because of the narrowing status games um, and the purity testing going on. So the AI safety movement is losing credibility. Um, by the way, whenever I talk to, to academics and, and, and commercial insiders, um, there are better strategies that we, can, that we can employ. There are better narratives that we can engage in, or maybe we need to craft entirely new narratives. Either way, it's all just a sign pointing that it's time to move on. So I hope that this video has the uh, desired impact, but thanks for watching. Have a good one. Cheers.